Hello folks, welcome back from Pastor Bob here, Place of Refuge. Today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2 and we'll be in um, 1 Timothy chapter 4 too. And the title I have is a call to work. Now there's a lot of titles I could have used on this one, but this is kind of predominantly the, you know, the vein that it's in is the call to work. So I'm going to be in Philippians chapter 2 and we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 18. So thank you and God bless. Here we go. And it reads, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that which worketh within you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless in the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as light. And then those are uh, in verse 16 too. holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, if I be offered upon the sacrifice service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And finally, verse 20, verse 18, excuse me. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Now this is, there's some, like I say every week, there's some powerful stuff here. The word beloved here, it's a its a real good word. And, um, you know, when you have agape, you have agapeo, and this was, it looks like agape tas, but it's pronounced agapateos, okay, which looks like agape. But it's another form of this kind of love, and it means esteemed and dear. Now get this, it says favorite. I have my wife, she always says she's his favorite, you know, and what that means is basically what is here. We're all his favorite. Now, it means favorite, worthy of love, spoken of only Christians, here it is, as united with God or with each other in the bonds of holy love. So that's a mouthful, I know, but that's what it means. Beloved. That's a good thing. And then it says, as ye have always obeyed, as not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Now, the word obey here means to listen. You and I need to listen to what God says. Amen means to hearken and be obedient, submit to, of the one who knocks on the door. This is what it said in the Greek, of the one who knocks on the door comes to listen to who it is. So think about this knocking. Amen. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, will sup with him, and he with me. Now that word, I stand. God is placed at the door of our heart. Stand, it means put and set. Stand by or near. Christ is always wants, he always wants us to obey. Always. He's always knocking on the door. And it's up to you, to, you and I to open that door up to the things of God. How many would agree with that? So he's always knocking. So don't ever forget that. He's always knocking. He wants you to answer and say, yes, what can I do for you? <laughs> All right. Then it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the work here means you're going to try to accomplish this and perform it. It means to carry out a task until it is finished. What's that mean? You and I as Christians, you can't give up. There's a lot of people right now. How many people do you know right now that maybe started off as good Christians? And maybe now they're not doing so well. Pray for them. But, you know, there's a lot of people that are kind of giving up. Is it hard? It is. Sometimes it can be hard, but if you walk worthy of your calling, that's going to bless you. Work out your own salvation. Now that word means a sa your, your own salvation. I mean, he's our deliverer. He's our safety. A preservation from danger or destruction. And that, you know, it's talking about the soul safety, if you will. Amen? With fear. Now, fear is a good word. You know, you and I have that fear of flight, you know, type thing that God has put in us. You know, we get that intuition like, hey, this is a dangerous situation. This here, it does mean phobos, but it means reverence. We need to have fear, reverence, and respect and honor for God. And then it says the fear of the Lord intensively in the fear and trembling. All right. And that's what it said. Now, the next word is trembling, but it even said that fear and trembling in the Greek. So what's trembling? It's quaking with fear. A profound reverence is what it means. You know, you and I 
need to re to respect God, honor Him, and fear Him in a way where we would protect His heart. We wouldn't want to do anything that would offend Him. Amen. So it's like one who, you know, we want to use our ability completely to meet all His requirements. Amen. And fulfill His duty. That's what it means, trembling. So this comment indicates you and I have a totally rely on the Lord for everything. How many would agree with that? Amen. Constant fellowship with God. That's where the key is, my friends. And that's where there's safety is doing what he tells you in fear and reverence and not in protecting his heart. Amen. For it is God which worketh in you both to his will or to, excuse me, both to will and to his good pleasure. So God is constantly working on us. Amen. It means to be operative. For it is God which worketh in you. It's that Holy Spirit. God's working in us. It means that we, he wants us to be operative and be at work and work for one. Amen? And aid one and be effective. He, we can be effective because he's working with us. Amen? To his will, to be resolved or determined, to purpose and take delight in and have pleasure, and to do his good pleasure. What's his good pleasure? It is his will, his choice, his delight, his desire, and his kindly intent. Now, this is a fun one. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. <laughs> Has God ever asked you to do something and you're just thinking, oh, I really don't want to do this, and you kind of get a little distaste in your mouth, and you think, I don't want to do this. You know, the murmurings here is muttering. It's a secret, it's a secret displeasure, not openly avowed, without grudging. In other words, that's what's used here. You know, you can have it in your heart, this murmuring, you might have a smile on your face, but deep down inside, you have a secret displeasure for maybe something that he wants you to do. Now, listen, folks, you know, if you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, you know, your flesh is going to kick up. He's going to, you know, he, this, this flesh that you have and you or I is going to say, oh, I don't want to do that, but we have to do it. And then we have to do it without grumbling, amen, without being murmuring. And then the word disputing means, or you dispute and you have contention hesitation. You ever hesitate when God wants you to do something? Or maybe a little arguing inside, you know? So I think let's combine the two together and then let me, let me uh, put in some Greek insertions on, on the latter part. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and do his good pleasure, which is true. Then do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now let me put in the Greek interpretation. Do all things without secret displeasure without grudging, without grumbling, and contention or hesitation or arguing. Why? Because here's the answer. If we do that, that you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, and we can say generation too, among whom you shine as lights in the world. All right. Be blameless. Now, the wonderful thing about Jesus Christ is he's forgiven us of all our sins. But a lot of times our actions will cause us to have some problems. Amen? Be blameless means to be free from fault or defect, deserving no censure. You know, that's pretty cool. And harmless. Be without mixture of evil. That's what it means to be harmless. Be without uh, a mixture of evil, free from guile. You let, let us be innocent, simple, without mixture of deceit. That's what that harmless means. That's quite a bit and just for one word. And harmless, what? The sons and daughters of God without rebuke. Amen? That cannot be censored. Blameless. We want to be blameless, irreproachable. Here it describes the believer to work out the salvation which he has been given by God. Amen? Why? Because you and I are in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation or generation. All right? The crooked means perverse. You know, I'm sure if you watch what's going on with all what's, you know, they want to try to get overturn this abortion thing and how wicked and perverse it really is. It's unfair, it's froward, it's bent, it's warped. And that's what it means here. And the perverse is those that are opposed to oppose and plot against the saving purpose and, and plans of God. The flesh always will come against the things of God. It really is. You have to put your flesh down. Turn aside from the right path or corrupt. So we have a, cor a crooked or, a, you know, one that's forward and warped and perverse nation. How many know that our nation is quickly moving away from God? Not all of us. We're 
pressing in, but there are a good number of people that are just letting it go. They don't care. I do care. Amen. I'm sure you do too. Hopefully we're doing with the latter of verse. What it says, so whom we will we will shine as light. Now I did a, a, a teaching on this, I don't know, it was three, four weeks ago. Let your light shine. We need to let our light shine. It doesn't want around pointing fingers, saying, hey, ain't a great God and all that. No, I'm just a great man of God. No, it's it means to be bright and resplendent and shed the light. And the light here is a word, um, it's very similar to the word foes, but this one is an illuminator. It means light and brightness in the world. We need to let our light shine. Hopefully when you walk in the room, you can bring some light and some happiness in this. You know, you ever you ever come into a room when somebody comes in and they're crabby or something like that? It just kind of sets the whole mood. You know, everybody's just like, oh my goodness, let's get the heck out of here. No, you got to let your light shine so people want to be around you. Amen. Why are you so happy? Tell them why. Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, and again, remember when we're getting into this, Paul's talking here. And he says, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Now, holding faith, holding forth, excuse me. Holding forth means to give attention to, give heed, to fix your mind upon something, not to lose not to lose, you know. Holding forth what? The word of life. The word here are moral precepts. Those are the ones that are given by God. And the life here is a word, it's really, you know, a lot of people say Zoe, Zoe is fine. It's the absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, life real and genuine, a life active and devoted to God. Now, I abbreviated that. The Greek interpretation on the paragraph is about that long. I picked a highlight. Look it up sometime. It's four twos. One, two, 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 two. Look it up in the strong. It'll give you nice things because it's even after life, we're blessed. Amen. Which we're going to be in heaven. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain. You know, any man of God that teaches doesn't want him to, he doesn't want to be thinking that he's doing things in vain that people don't care. Hear that not in vain means empty, devoid of truth, destitute of spiritual wealth. Fruitless and without effect. You know, always Paul always talked about, like, you know, in the Greek, there was a lot of games. All right. Kind of the Olympic type thing, if you will. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Here's a little side scripture. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, which is true, but one receiveth the prize. So we, you and I, and so he says, so run that you may obtain. Amen. We want to be obtained. Run means to spend one's strength. Go for it. Amen. And performing or attaining something. And, you know, here's a good question. What are we spending our time on? What do we spend our time and our strength on? What race are we running? Are we running God's race or are we running our own? Amen. See, God, are we running God's or are we running the world? That's a good question. Think about that. Only you can answer that. What we spend our money on, what we spend our time, what we think about, there's where your heart's going to be. Check it sometime. I do inventory like that. If I'm thinking something else is a little more important, I do it. And I think, whoa, Lord, I'm sorry. No, this has almost become an idol. Amen? Verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Now, Paul put his heart and soul into spreading the gospel. He did. And Paul was willing to do anything that would to spread it, even to the point of death. And if you know your Bible, you know that's true. Amen. Even now. For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. Paul would count it as a privilege. Amen. For the cause of Christ. For anything. You know, he had such a dedication for that. The same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with who? Me. Amen. Now we're going to switch. We were in Philippians. Now we're going to go into another one, which is kind of like keeping the faith, if you will. And this is Second Timothy Chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. All right, and I'll read that to the left here. Now this, you know, this, you know, I the name of my uh, sermon is a call to work, but this one could be preach the word as well. There's a lot of subtitles you could use, but you can only put one title to it, so you'll get the drift of it. This here, here reads this, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, the instant in season, out of season, Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? 
For the time will come and they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. In verse 8, um, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, to give me at that day, and not only to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Now I added a few verses there. I said verses 1 through 5, but I wanted to get to the verse 8 too. Now, get the, when Paul charges here, it means he's, he's calling charge to be a witness. Bear witness. Testify earnestly. He's exhorting earnestly. That's what I mean. I charge thee therefore. Okay, to what? And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall do what? Judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. All right? The word ju judge, God's going to pick it out. He's going to select and choose and pronounce judgment. Amen? He's going to do it. That's why we need to walk worthy of our calling, my friends. And he's going to judge what? The quick. That's a word called zeo, and that means those are the ones that are living, not lifeless, not dead. And then he's going to judge the dead as well. Those are the ones that are deceased, but it also means ones that are lifeless. And in a metaphoric sense, my friends, if you look it up in the Greek, you know what it says also? Spiritually dead. Are you spiritually dead? I hope not. You need to you know, fan that flame, get it going, amen? And then what will take place? This is going to, I mean, excuse me, when will this take place? Is at his appearing in his kingdom. So appearing, this is a Greek word, is only by Paul for the second and future appearance of God. That's when he pretty much predominantly uses that. So it's coming at his appearing in his kingdom, the reign of the Messiah, the territory subject to the rule of a king. Who's the king? King Jesus, praise the Lord. Amen. Here's what it says in verse 2. It says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Amen. So here we go. Preach means to proclaim, announce publicly, to be a herald, public proclamation of what? The gospel. Preach the gospel. So preach the word. The word is the sayings of God, the moral precepts given to us by God, the word of God, Jesus Christ. Be instant. What does it mean to be instant? It means to be at hand. It means to be ready, stand by, pressing, and be earnest in this. In season. Now, I want, us, I want you to just clip along with me on this one. You got in season and out of season. Now, you'll find something interesting here about both these points. Okay, what does it mean to be in season? It means when the opportunity occurs, or it's conveniently. All right, that's what it means, in season. But then it says out of season. Now get this. It means unseasonable, without season or time, involving opportunity. So we preach God's word both when we believe it's appropriate to do so, and when it's not, and when it's kind of inconvenient. In other words, we got to do it both in season and out of season, there is no reason for us not to share. Now, I will admit, you and I need to measure our entrance. Sometimes, if somebody's having a bad day and, you know, whatever it is, you, it might not be the right time. You can offer a prayer for them and pray, but it might be the right time. Only the Holy Spirit will tell you that. But just be ready. Be at hand, instant in season and out of season. Now, <clears throat> here it says what we he wants us to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's five things that he wants us to do. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with long suffering and doctrine. Five is the number of grace in the Bible. I see that that signature all through the Bible when there's grace, you know, or something that he wants to do. Seven is spiritual perfection, it goes on from there. But here we go. We got five things. Reprove. What's that mean? He wants us to convict and refute and bring to the light and to expose. So, reprove here is the same Greek word we used last week, I believe it was. Remember when we talked about Ephesians 5.11? Have no fellowship to do with any fruit, unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, which in essence means to expose them. All right, so we need to expose. So, okay, reprove and expose to see where a thing is genuine. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness was last week, but 
Here we need to rebuke. What's that mean? Now, you know, you got to use your head when you do this. Rebuking doesn't mean that you're going to get in somebody's face, make them feel like a fool. No, it means to be admonished or char you can charge sharply, but you have to do it out of love. You know, you got to beseech with a stronger force. This is a little more to rebuke, okay? But again, I would ask you to make sure that you do it out of love. Exhort. That means to admonish and encourage. Amen? Strengthen, entreat, and beseech. Call upon which may be done in a way of exhortation or entreaty and comfort. Now, it tells us to do these things, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. How? With long suffering. My friends, this word, I've come to love this word. I really have. And here's what it means, patience. You got a lot of patience? Anybody got patience? Anybody want to pray for patience? It's so funny about praying for patience. Back in the early days, I was very short-tempered many, many years ago. And I said, Lord, I need patience. Lord, I need patience. And things got worse and worse. And I kept praying and got worse and worse. And then it clicked. You know, <laughs> I didn't get it. But, if, you know, we need to have patience and endurance. And the word constancy, that is a word, constancy. Look it up. It's awesome. It means to have steadfastness, perseverance. And here it is, my friend. This is why this word has become one of my favorite words slowness and avenging wrongs. You and I need to be patient. Slowness and avenging wrongs. Look, there's going to be people that are not as spiritual as you are, and I, I don't mean that in a very, you know, in a high level thing. It's just the way it is. Some people are babes in Christ. You may know more. Just do it with long suffering. Don't worry, you know, like, what's the matter with you, fool? How come you did that? No, you can't be like that. You got to be, you know, slowness and avenging wrongs. You want to bring them in. Amen? Glory to God. But then you do with doctrine, teaching, and instruction, tutoring. May I submit, do it with the Word of God. That's the true doctrine. Amen? So we have reprove, rebuke, exhort, long-suffering, and doctrine. And here's why. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Oh. But after their own lust, they shall heed to themselves teachers having itching year, ears. I said years. Ears. Having itching ears. All right, so what's the time? All right, so this, when you see time, there's usually two words in the Greek, kairos and chronos. This one's kairos, and it means due measure to what time brings, the state of the times, and that's kind of where we're at, the state of the times, and the things in events of time. So the time will come, what? When they will not endure, what? They will not hold up. They're not going to keep one's self erect. They're, going to be, they're not going to be firm or sustained. They're not going to endure sound doctrine. Now, the sound is one who keeps the graces and is strong and true and pure and uncorrupted in doctrine. That's our teaching and instruction. So, <laughs> here's the problem, my friends. Now, you guys have been with me for a while. We have people now determining what God says is true and not true. So the people, some of the preachers and teachers, they're not hanging on to true doctrine. They're saying, well, we can do this and we can do that. No, you can't. You have to do exactly what it says. It's his way or the highway. And I'm, I'm not trying to be cruel here, but we need to hear to sound doctrine. If you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, you need to change now, today, this minute you hear this. Repent. Why? Because he's coming back soon. And so the reason that happens is they're going to go after their own lust. Now, again, listen to what the lust is. It's desire, it's craving, longing, and here, here's what it is. If you can remember this, it's 1939 in the Strong's, and it means desire for what is forbidden. Now, some of my former messages, Adam and Eve, they could eat any of the tree of the garden, but one they couldn't. So what do they desire? The one that they couldn't. You know, and so we're in this mess we're in now. But, you know, that's human nature. We always have a desire for what is forbidden. You know, it's like, why? God's holding back. No, he's not. He's trying to protect you. Amen? So this is how things get screwed up in the body of Christ. People will not endure sound doctrine. The next thing you know, folks, believe this or not, I know of a church that teaches there's no hell. Can you believe that? You know, when I was young, I would have run to hell with that. That's not good. There is a hell. There's going to be a judgment, and he's coming back. So what do they do? They're going to heap themselves teachers. Heap means they're going to accumulate in piles, <laughs> piles up these teachers. Now, the teacher here, 
The interpretation here is for teachers that should be the ones who teach things concerning the things of God. Unfortunately, this is not the case here. It's false teachers and those who have itching ears. People that want to hear things, they want to hear. Now, here's how it works. This has happened to me before as a pastor. I've been a pastor for a long, long time. Itching ears. Now, let me give you that example. It means tickle, make to itch. You know, isn't it something when you got something in your back you can't scratch, you got to get a back scratch? It'll just drive you crazy. So they got itching ears, and those who have a desire to hear something pleasant. Oh, tell me good things, Pastor. Tell me that I'm okay doing and staying in my sin and everything's going to be all right. I can't do that because that's not what the Word teaches. Now, I want to be fair. There's nothing wrong, wrong with wanting to hear pleasant things. But when it comes to God's word, you have to hear the truth. You can't, you can't do things and have somebody say, oh, I think God's, I think grace covers it. I think you're okay. Now, I'm talking about a habitual lifestyle now. I'm not talking about make mistakes. Yes, of course, God forgives us. And we have to confess our sins and move on. But if you're going to live in a circumstance where God says not to be doing this, there's going to be some, you know, severe consequences. It just don't work out. You got to do it God's way. Amen. So it, we don't want, so they're coming after their desires, their, their own lusts, their own things that are desired for forbidden. It's not going to work. Verse four, and they turn away their ears from what? The truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's what happened. So they turn away. Okay. So what that means, very simple to remove anything from anyone, the word of God, you know, they're, you know they, this, the word of God is, our sore, is it not? And here's one interpretation that when it when it says turn away, it's like putting the sword back in the sheath. May I submit to you? It's like not reading your Bible or paying attention to what, what it says in it. You put your sword back in the sheath and you're not using the sword of life. Amen? So you don't want to do that. So turning away ears or the faculty of hearing. And then what happens when you do that? It's going to be turned into fables, to fiction. And an invention, a falsehood, a tale, or a fable. Okay, now let me tell you this. If those that are going to uh, reject the truth, they're going to be prone to believe any falsehood around. Because they're not going to be spiritually discerning. They're going to be looking for things they want to hear. Listen, the Bible says this, my friends. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. So let me ask you, what would you want to hear? Do you want to hear the truth? Or do you want to see, hear somebody kissing up to you all the time and tell, oh, honey, you're okay when you're not? You want to be able to change. Glory to God. Amen. But then it says, but watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. You and I are all ministers. If you're a Christian, you're a minister. You might not be, have the title pastor, apostle, and all this other stuff, but I will say this. He wants us to watch. You know what that means to be calm and collected in spirit? You need, you and I need to be calm and collected in spirit. Be, be temperate, circumspect, which means to consider all circumstances and the possible consequences when you do something. That's what it means to be circumspect. Circumspect. Isn't that something? That's a good word. Endure affliction. Suffer. You know, there's going to be, the gospel is not easy. You know, people are going to make fun of you. You know, they think you're a Bible bender or stuff like that. But listen, it's going to be worth it. Because believe me, this world's passing away, and we're going to have a new one coming up. And when he comes back, you're going to be standing in good standing with the Lord if you're hanging on. Don't just say, well, God's not coming back for a while, so I can eat, drink, and be merry. Party down. No, don't. Endure it. Endure it. Endure it. Amen. Do the work of an evangelist. Those are the ones that bring good tidings, the one who declares good news. It's very simply preaching the gospel. You know, you don't have to stand on the corner stuff. There's people that do that. And I think it's a wonderful thing. If God's called you to do that, do that. But, you know, it's just walking worthy of your call. When somebody be instant in season and out of season, somebody asks you, hey, why are you so happy? What's, you know, what's up with you? It doesn't seem to bother you what's going on. You say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. You know, share the gospel. That's being an evangelist. Amen. Make full proof of thy ministry of your walk of God. Okay, so the proof means to make one certain, persuaded, fully convinced, or sure, great God of thy ministry, of those by the commands of God promote Christianity among men. In other words, you share the God. Now here's, now Paul, it's believed here, some believe that on this next one, verse 6, that Paul was already sentenced to death prior to him writing this. So he says, for I am now ready to be offered, you know, um, offered in the time of my departures at hand. Somehow or another, there was something coming his way that he knew this is going to be the end. And so 
So here, here's something we all need. So what's he say? I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. A good fight. Paul many times used terms like this fighting or games and stuff, running the race and stuff. You know, it's all through the Newer Testament. And he wrote like 13 books of the Bible. Some people maybe waver on the book of Hebrews, but anyways, that's neither here nor there right now. You know, he's very active in it. So because of the Greeks, and, in, and they had games in there, I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith. I've kept the faith means he's guarded the faith, he kept it, he obeyed it, he watched. You know, the gospel was Paul's focus, and may I submit to you, it needs to be our focus, you know, through life. You know, if you're working a in a factory or your whatever you're doing, a contractor or teacher, it doesn't matter. Let your sphere of influence let impact that with the with the with the body of Christ. You know, with Jesus in you, you can be a light in a dark place. You know, I mean, a lot of times you don't even have to say nothing. I'll just ask you, hey, why aren't you bugged about this? But you can just say, Well, I got calm and collected in my spirit because I believe in God and I know He's got this. Amen. I've kept the faith. Now here you go. Now, we're going to get into a little more on this next time. So we'll get, now we told you the bad things, kind of bad things, not real bad. But the next one, we're going to talk about what's some good things. Not that this wasn't good. Henceforth, there is laid up for me what? A crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me, who? Paul, at, this, at that day, and he will. And not to me only, now this is for you and I, but... All unto all also that love his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Are you waiting for him? Or are you doing things because you don't think he's going to be here for a while? You know, check your heart. Amen. So I hope this ministered to you. I thank you very much for listening. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this group. I pray that, Father, that we keep the faith. We're faithful and to endure afflictions and not give up. Stay the course and hold the line. So, Lord, bless these folks. I give you praise in Jesus' name and your glory. Amen. God bless you, folks. I'll catch you next week. Take care.